Hello, everyone. I'm Jane Kim, Industry Programming Producer at TIFF, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to the 2021 Toronto International Film Festival Industry Conference. I'd like to thank our lead sponsor, Bell, our major sponsors, RBC, L'Oreal Paris, and Visa, our major industry supporters, Telefilm Canada and Ontario Creates, and our co-presenter, Breaking Through the Lens. Up now is Michael Sreshen from A Moment to a Movement, how finance is changing the industry for women and non-binary filmmakers. We assembled an incredible lineup of guests who will discuss how changes to financing can better support women and non-binary creators in the industry. Hosting the discussion is Angelique Jackson, film and media reporter at Variety. And now to get things started, I'll hand it over to Angelique. Well, thank you so much, Jane, and thank you, Tiff, for the warm welcome. I am Angelique Jackson with Variety, and this is, as she said, from a moment to a movement, where we will be looking at how mindful finance can fuel a more inclusive world of entertainment. This panel is presented by Breaking Through the Lens, an initiative which, which supports female and non-binary directors at top tier film markets. The initiative is supported by Catherine Mosley's 1220 Entertainment, and TIFF's Share Her Journey campaign. Now at the end of this hour, we'll be showing the pitch presentations of this year's top 10 Breaking Through the Lens finalists. So please do stick around after the conversation for that. And also viewers, you can submit questions at any time during the conversation using the chat function. And I will try to get to as many as possible during the Q&A at the end of our session. But now it's time for what you've all been waiting for, our panel. Joining us today, it is my pleasure to introduce Effie Brown, CEO of Game Changer Films, a production company and development fund dedicated to multi-platform projects by and about women, people of color, LGBTQ plus individuals, and people with disabilities. Next, we have Renee Tab, an Emmy and Golden Globe nominee and the founder and president of Sentient Entertainment, where she's focused her business on the representation of international filmmakers and emerging mm -hmm. female voices. We also have Funa Maduka, filmmaker, producer, and former head of international original films at Netflix, where she has worked with the world's top global and emerging filmmakers for over six years. We have River Gallo, a GLAAD award-winning Salvadorian American filmmaker, actor, writer, model, and intersex advocate. River was named one of the most exciting queer people to follow by Out Magazine. And last but certainly not least, we have Delphine Perrier, the CEO and founding partner of Highland Film Group, an independent worldwide sales, film financing, production, and distribution company. Woo! Well, I mean, just the resumes alone on this panel, y'all are all such incredible filmmakers and parts of our, our marvelous industry. So thank you so much for lending your time and your expertise to this conversation. I know the audience is going to get a lot out of this discussion. And yes, again, thank you for being here. So let's let's get started. Um, I think a lot of the reason why people tune in to panels and conversations like this is to get a little bit of practical advice from folks who have done it first. Um, so my first question kind of goes to all of you, but what is one thing that you've learned about the relationship between filmmaking and film financing that you learned throughout your career that you wish someone would have told you at the start? What is the one thing you were like, Man, it would have been great if somebody mentioned that day one. <laughs> Effie, I saw a big laugh from you, so I will ask you. The story of my life. I'm like, there's so many things I wish I would have known <laughs> 20 years ago and 20 pounds, you know, ago. Um, but I'll say when it comes to financing, you know, I, what I wish I would have known then is that our stories matter and that our stories are good business. That was a, you know, I came up as a producer, but that's the one thing that I believe the hype that, and I know Funa and Delphine can probably speak to this more of like, that our stories don't sell overseas. You know, that you have to be a part of the dominant story or dominant culture in order to make an impact. And if I would have written, I'm bummed that like, I, I believe that lie. So I wish like the, someone would have come back in like a time machine was like, it's all lies, it's all lies. <laughs> Go out there and do it, you know. So that's what I wish. Well, Funa or Delphine, would you guys like to piggyback onto that? Who would like to go first? Well, yeah, I think I, you know, I had a privilege working in the international space. And I think the last time I was with Effie, we were in a, in a lobby in Cairo, <laughs> Egypt. But, you know, having spent a lot of time overseas, you do see that, you know, 
speak for black culture, I, you know, it, it is very dominant. Like, and so when you hear like, so if music, if our clothing and all of these other things can travel, our movies can't. So, <laughs> you know, it was really good to be in this kind of position where, you, you know, you're seeing actually on the ground that this myth really is a myth. Um, and I think, I guess if I were to add on something to your initial question, Angelique, I think one thing that I wish I had known um, is how important it is to make sure um, the person or entity that you're getting money from really does matter. Um, because oftentimes it's really great to get the check, but that check can be tied to with a lot of strings, a lot of obligations. Um, there can be impact on your creative vision. So really before you accept funds, you accept the check, you accept any kind of um, any kind of funding to really make sure that the values are aligned from the creator to the financer. Very good point. And, and something that a lot of people probably don't think of when they get that first, you know, you finally get the money to make your dream project and you don't realize, you know, there may be some, some, like you said, strings tied to that. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Delphine, I would I would, add, yo, please go ahead. Yeah. I would add that for me, it's the um, time is very important. And we always think that we should go slowly. I said, no, I said, just go for it. Move fast because you need a long time to make a project happen and time flies. So it's like, just go for it. Don't be afraid of anything. Worst case scenario, people say, no, who cares? Then you go somewhere else. And then some people is going to say yes. So I say time. And then the other thing is probably like, don't be afraid to work in a department that it's not really what you wanted to do at the beginning because the movie business is really learning how it works from A to Z, which is like, creative, but financing, sales, distribution, you need to know the entire thing to be the most efficient and get your project out there. So don't be afraid of getting into a department that is not supposed to be what you want. Um, just go for it. You'll learn something. Marketing is important. Everything is important. Absolutely. Uh, Renee, what about you? What do you wish someone would have told you? Well, many things, <laughs> but in terms of representation, and hi, everyone. Hi, Fona, nice to see you again. In terms of representation, you know, we start out at many representatives, and you take on an artist, and you take on their passion projects, but at sometimes we weren't thinking about the other side and what the audience in particular wanted to see. So what I have really made an effort in doing is crafting the stories we shape and the stories the artists are telling in conjunction with what the buyers and distributors want to release to serve the audiences. And we get so specific now where we will talk to our partners in Germany and what is working for your audiences and what do they want to hear? What do they want to see? What do they want to feel? So that our filmmakers are not working in a vacuum. We are we have really early on strategy to really shape the stories so we make sure they're seen and told and financed. So I just wish I'd done it sooner and I'm glad I'm doing it now. It, it keeps the conventional wisdom from being just a just basic, you're able to actually get the nuance of what the industry and what the audience is really looking for. Um, River, so we'll close this question out with you. What do you wish someone would have told you? Um, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah, okay. Um, first of all, thank you so much for having me and also everyone's answers. I'm just like jotting things down in my head because I'm still very early in my career and I'm like gonna remember all of that. Um, <laughs> But something that I have kind of going off of what Funa said, um, just trusting your intuition more about like when a financier or a producer or a company feels like a fuck boy, they probably are and they're gonna reveal themselves. Um, but secondly, I would also say that um, I feel like as an activist, sometimes I, I, I want my whole project to be representative of of the inclusivity that I want the film world to have. Mm -hmm. But the reality is a lot of cis men are the people that cut the checks and kind of being okay with the fact that like we need that allyship to be supported and to be uplifted and to not be so critical of yourself as a woman or a non-binary or trans or queer filmmaker to be like, oh, well, I'm getting help from like the bad guys or something because they're, you know, if the, if people are really here to tell your story, to help you amplify your voice and tell your story, 
they're they're playing an important role in um, the diversification of film and the and the, the pushing forward of what this movement is all about. Well, I really do want to dig into that allyship conversation here in a minute, but let's start at the baseline with where we are at this moment in the industry. You know, there have been major strides for inclusion the first time in the 93 year existence of the Oscars that the Academy nominated two women for best director. Um, we, you know, we hear that casting is, is becoming more diverse, but there are still a lot of things that, you know, behind the scenes may not be uh, helping uh, in that in that fight. So I guess the question is, are we truly seeing the systemic change in the way that business is conducted in our industry? And, you know, what signs are you all seeing as industry professionals that, you know, the gatekeepers of our industry have had no, an awakening or, or whether or not that actually is real? So, you know, River, since you are kind of in the midst of launching your uh, very special project in Pony Boy, where, where do you see the industry at this is at this present moment? Are we truly seeing that systemic change? I I firmly believe that there is a change happening, and we are in the middle of it. I guess something about change is that it happens uh, not linearly, and it's like kind of like happens in a spiral where we have to like kind of revisit some speed bumps along the road that, that we were like, didn't we just talk about this and get over it, but then it's not completely over, I guess. Um, but for me, I guess, in the term, in terms of my film, um, you know, I, I wrote my script uh, at the beginning of, of 2020 last year and went out to many producers and companies and, um, you know, got, got a lot of passes and stuff. And, but it, it really is the one who, who, decides to take it and getting that one yes that matters. Um, but for me, I, I have noticed the fact that um, I think it was the more trans narratives being in the media um, and just kind of this explosion of just more inclusion of, of having trans narratives becoming part of popular culture that made me feel like it was time for um, my story, which is an intersex narrative, to be primed for audiences to be able to, to receive it in a way that um, they felt like psychologically ready to handle all the questions of, of gender that, that the trans and non-binary communities have been pushing. Um, and so, for me, I just feel like even the fact that like I'm now in a place where my film, I've secured financing and, um, you know, I, I'm planning to shoot in February. I'm like, that to me is all saying that like, yeah, maybe there's still some speed bumps in general that the industry has to come, come across. But for the fact that there are no, literally no intersex uh, characters or films in the current TV and film landscape and that like my little train is like chugging along, I'm like, okay, that is change. And that is, and that is something that probably couldn't happen five years ago. Um, and it's due to, you know, um, creators and people on this panel and the people in, you know, TV shows like Pose that like have just been pushing the agenda ever, you know, steadily that have made it so that the ground is fertile for a creator like me now to be able to, um, you know, now, my voice to be heard. Absolutely, it's historic. It needs to be championed. I see Effie cheering <laughs> there at the top of my screen. You know, so what does the the financing for a, a, a film like Pony Boy um, indicate to you, Effie? You know, where do you see these indicators that things are changing in our industry or not? You know, I have to say, like First River, your story. Thank you for being so positive and like optimistic because I'm going to be an old bitter bitch. Just kidding. No, <laughs> just kidding. Not really. Um, no, um, I like that was really inspiring, you know, to hear, you know, and we are, you know, that's one of the reasons why, you know, just coming into Game Changer, you know, and and heading that, you know, heading the, the new part of the company up is because we need to, when I say we, meaning women, non-binary, people of color, LGBTQ, and people with disability, we need to be telling our own stories and being able to finance our own stories. Like everything, being a director and a writer and those sorts of things, like um, I feel that there's an easier path and play for them because 
it's good business now as well, right? Like everybody realized that they're tired of seeing that dominant storyline. They're like, what do you have? What's, you know? So th there seems to be a bit more of a door opening, but, you know, talking from the producerial side or the business side and being able to fund and be able to write the check ourselves really means something. And so what I'm seeing, and I'm grateful to be where I am right now, and I'm really grateful at, for allyship because that's how the majority of our funding has happened for our films and actually the mounting of our company Game Changer. And we are looking for more diverse and inclusive sources of financing. But right now we're happy with what we have and high five allies. What I'm seeing in the industry um, right now is that it feels to me, and I'm curious, I'm just sort of putting this out to folks, it feels to me that the days of independently financing something that's really small and flipping it, sort of coming to an end because there's not that many places nowadays to show your wares, you know, with COVID and now with structures, you know, being a little smaller to be able to make, you know what I mean? To be able to turn over, you know, to turn over your project, you know, for, because this is show business, it's not show charity. Like let's, I also want to be very clear with that, you know, well, I mean, like, you know, it's like, this is show business. I do believe you can educate as you entertain. I do believe like film and television is my form of activism. But at the end of the day, it's a business and things need to make good business sense. But what I'm finding is for now, in order to finance those stories that I'm like, look, we're going to make this with our own voice. You can't make something about us without us. Like that's our motto at Game Changer, period. I'm finding that I still have to go to the bigger dogs, the studios, in order to co-finance when I say in studios also being with distribution, because that's becoming to me where I'm seeing those partnerships are, whereas before, you know, and I'm curious if maybe it'll change and I'm like, I just and I hoping that it does. But right now it seems like I can co-finance something like I'm co-financing a film right now with a 24 called the inspection. Like where I can co-finance something, but I need to have a direct line for a distributor for my investors and my financiers to feel like this is a good bet because the days of going to a festival and flipping, those opportunities are seeming a little far less. And um, and then I'm sure you're gonna get to it, but then seeing when you're partnering with someone, um, and I think it was River again, I'm just like quoting you, you know, all day. But like, you know, they don't look <laughs> like me. All right, people on this, you know, on this panel that are writing those checks or green lighting those films. So it's also having to sort of traverse that bridge, you know, without sounding preachy or confrontational, confrontational, but also like, come, come to the bright side. Come on. So that was my long winded answer. No, it's a great answer. And it brings up a lot of our kind of important questions of where the landscape is right now. You know, Funa, where do you see it? You are, of course, in the independent filmmaking space, but also have worked in the streaming space that is becoming more and more uh, uh, popular slash important as our theatrical you know, distribution is changing as well. Um, First, it was just changing because of streaming, and now it's changing because of COVID too. So, what has your experience been, and what what what's what what are you seeing guidepost wise when it comes to uh, the diversification of the industry? Yeah, no, you know, I I I, I always agree with Effie, <laughs> um, and I think she hit it on the head as far as um, what we're seeing is a a contraction of opportunity for the kind of stories that are sort of like when I started at Netflix, there was this plethora of, of independent film companies that, you know, we were buying from and over time, um, <laughs> um, it sort of came to the point where, you know, at this point, for example, as a filmmaker, if you make, if you for somehow miraculously get $5 million to make your film and you make it, I, the chances of you making that 5 million back, it's difficult. It's hard. Um, maybe um, you, if, if you're lucky, I think in success, you'll get like 10 or 15% above the 5 million. Like that is success, right? Like if you can end in that range. And so you start to sort of think, well, well, what, what are the opportunities? Where can we go next? Right. And also the other thing too, is um, when you sell that $5 million film, you're giving it away, right? So if you, um, that they're taking it, most streamers are going to be taking an all rights deal. And so you're sort of left back at the beginning, starting all over again. 
And I think what's really cool, um, I've actually, um, over the last years and during COVID, um, I've, I've um, really started exploring the crypto space and NFTs. Oh. And um, and really right now I'm exploring with a few partners. Um, you know, we've recently started an MVP and initial seed, gotten some initial seed funding to think about how um, independent filmmakers can use the NFT model to not only um, retain ownership of their films, but also increase discoverability um, and also create community around these films. Because I think that is the biggest thing as we are, you know, has touched on um, theaters are moving more towards studio and big studio films. Um, and so what the theater really gave for independent films was a community, right? So you think about some of the filmmakers that we laud and we love today, they started off making these smaller films. You know, Barry Jenkins had a group of people who were going to see um, his early films um, in the theater and they started following his career. How can we then replicate that in the metaverse? And it's been really interesting to kind of see you know, in speaking with folks who are in the NFT space, um, there's already been folks who have been using this model. There's a Ethereum film documentary that raised $2 million earlier this year. Um, Mila Kunis and Ashton Kutcher raised $8 million for their series earlier. Um, and I, you know, I can go into the whole entire like um, uh, benefit structure and benefit model. But I think it's a really interesting way that I would like to encourage more of our industry to start talking about, because what I really love about it is the sovereignty it gives back to the filmmaker um, to be able to kind of own their story, work with the community and build on top of that. Because I think what we're going to see personally, like when I think about when people ask me about what is the future of the film industry? I'm seeing decentralization. I'm seeing individuals becoming their own studios. Um, and I know it, it's, it, it sounds very far off given the landscape that we are now, but we actually right now with this tool have the power to build it. And which is why, you know, my partners and I are really excited about um, where, where this can go and really putting the, the, the power back in the hands of storytellers. And I mean, that is the, the hard part as, as you kind of explain it. And as Effie said as well, is that idea of, you know, if we we have to be a part of the full telling of our stories, but it, it also has to be a part of the ownership of our stories, because if not, it's kind of a, you know, ever changing and, and or, or a never ending cycle is really what it is. Um, Delphine, how do you see our current status in the industry and 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 how much of this change is actually occurring? What are some of those indicators uh, that you're seeing that are proving that things are changing? Um, <clears throat> so at Highland, we're a little bit more traditional in our way to finance and put movie um, to the screen. Um, we do finance by the pre-sale model, by selling uh, to the domestic partner or interna and international. Mm -hmm. So all together, you know, we put a financing together, go to a bank, get a loan, finance the movie and go in production. And then after that, we um, we distribute. So Island actually just started a distribution branch um, because we were a little actually tired of seeing everybody stealing our movies for all rights, for perpetuity, for no money after the fact. And we do all the heavy lifting, really, of putting the financing together and helping the producer and the talent and everybody to get in front of the screen. So um, I think that the challenge with like that model is that we are dealing with the entire world. So mm. bringing diversity and parity and gender and all that stuff is really, really hard because not everybody in the world is going at the same speed in evolution. Um, some countries are not yet open to it. Some countries refuse it. Some other countries just, you know, are totally open. It's very actually fascinating to see like where it works really easily, where it doesn't work to have diversity. Um, the, the great thing I think is that, you know, we always complain about what happened and changes. And so when the big like um, platform arrived and like Netflix, the worldwide distributor, Amazon and all those people arrived, everybody was freaking out because the model is kind of like collapsing the old traditional way. But those people actually open tons of doors because they have the power to actually say, yes, we're going to put like a TV show with black women on it. And you're all going to have to look at it. 
And it's fantastic because it helped all the other one, all the independent um, international distributor to be like, oh, okay, I'm going to take it. And also to come back to what Ellie and Renee said about the storytelling is that, yes, any story is good to say. And that's why we're all in the cinema business, entertainment business, is that we are here to communicate our stories. But I agree with Renee that we also need to be aware of our environment and figure out how to tell that story so it works with the time we are in, with the trend that goes on. And you can tell anything to anybody, kind of like in Life of Pi. It's just how you tell the story. And definitely, you know, for example, now you don't really want too much of a drama. Um, people like a lot of humor in the story, even if it's dramatic, um, just because it's the time we're in. Nobody really wants to see any drama right now. So changes, yes, there is tons every day. It's fantastic. More women, more everything, more difference. Yes, it's coming. Everybody is opening little by little. We just keep pushing, keep doing what we do. And it will be better and better. Well, tell me too a bit about, you know, from your perspective of being in that sales and distribution industry as, you know, the leader of a female led company in, in this very male dominated space. You know, you are a group of all women uh, primarily uh, working to get these movies sold. You know, where, where in the terms of the sales model, um, how have you seen? that part of the system change in terms of, you know, what we were discussing about the audience and their interest in these particular movies when it comes to those, you know, those demographic labels and the sales strategy, you know, like a black film, an LGBTQ film, a woman's film, are they necessary or are they limiting the seats at the table for the filmmakers? Where, where are they kind of in the, the play place for getting the movie sold at the moment? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that for the wide audience, it, it limits, but it's necessary because I think that then having those labels kind of like install ideas faster. But after that, we need to get to the point where we don't need labels anymore. We don't need them, which that should be normal. If you talk to a five years old and you say that person is black, they're going to see what you mean. Like they don't see that. So why are we not? like that anymore you know what I mean like whatever difference my kids like see them in a very different way than adult people so we should be like that we should go back to our roots of being normal altogether so labels are important at the beginning I think but eventually I really want to be like rid of those um, being a female company in this industry is funny is uh, a lot of fun because um, I was um, explaining before, we are called the girls, so which is hilarious because my partner and I are really past the age of being called girls. But, you know, I take the compliment. <laughs> I'm like, sure, I'm a girl. I'm a young girl. But um, we are called the girls because we're two women uh, driving this company. And then um, the irony of it is that we focus on very strong action uh, full of an action movie with old white men. Not only white, but like Bruce Willis, Stallone, you know, like all of those guys. And so it's very, very funny because um, we do that. And everybody knows that they can come to have old guy in action movies at our place. However, we're really um, open to like ideas of like messages. We love messages, but it, it it still needs, because of our model of financing, it needs to talk to a large audience and you need to tell it a certain way so the large audience can finance it and eventually see it. You know, you want more and more people to see your film. You, you don't want less people. You want the more people to see it. So yeah, it's fun. Listen, it is what it is. Women, I never thought that I was different. I'm just a woman. I mean, let's let's talk about that. That that you know, following up on exactly that question, these demographic labels um, that are kind of a part of the sales strategy at the moment with with film. You know, where does everyone else stand on uh, the role that they play in in the filmmaking process and how you know, calling something a, a black film, an LGBTQ film, how? I guess what, basically, yeah. Where does everybody stand on um, the labeling of our of our projects? 
Renee, you talk. Okay, good. I was going to call him like, you speak. <laughs> you, can talk. You, took of, you took the words out of my mouth, Effie. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, you know, my family's from Iran, so I'm an Iranian-American woman, and I started as an agent in representation, and it was not, you know, common to be an Iranian-American woman. I remember a male producer said to me, how do you do it in a Jewish man's field? And I said, if I looked in the mirror every day and said, you're Iranian American, you are not a Jewish man, I wouldn't get out of bed. I don't even think about it. You know, I just am. You know, I just exist. I am. And, you know, the women, I had looked at Sue Mengers and Tony Howard, and these were vivacious broads. They spoke their minds. You know, they weren't so corporatized as things have become. So in terms of the female experience, you know, as an agent, it was, it was definitely, you had to be strong, you had to be tough. I mean, I think it's changed a lot today and there's a lot more female agents and they can have a lot more fun with it, but it was intense. And the client list was predominantly male. If I think about the women we had on the client list, it was Nancy Myers, and I'm talking filmmakers, mm -hmm. uh, Julie Tamor and Sofia Coppola, you know, and then we had others, you know, I, I was a part of breaking Catherine Hardwick at Sundance, and that was extraordinary, you know, with 13. And when, you know, a woman like that popped, it, it just became this amazing experience for the agency, for the client, and, you know, then her career followed. But it's definitely changed from the peer view of representation and production. And I know your question was more about, you know, labeling films, but I'll get to it. But I think in terms of, <laughs> of who, you know, now, you know, as a producer, when I put my producer hat on, if I'm making, we're remaking the others at Universal and we're speaking. And, and the first thing I said to the head of the studio was, I really feel we need females behind this. You know, Grace, we're dealing with a complicated female story. And I think we really want to get under her skin. So it wasn't, I, I need a, a white woman, an Iranian woman, a black woman. It was like, I just think we should get a female. But then we started hearing different takes. And one take came to us and it was about a Latin family. Um, and the studio and I discussed and we said, we really need a Latin family person, writer, screenwriter, to bring that take to us or, or create it with us. And then we just started hearing different takes. And it happened to be this version from a writer from Mexico that felt very authentic because it was her story to tell. And it wasn't like we had gone out saying, we have to have A, B, and C. I also have a great passion for the Latin culture. I lived in Argentina. I speak Spanish for fun. I mean, I just love it. So for me, it's it's it just, it worked it always. But I would love to be in a place where we're not saying, it has to be this movie and and, this, and these, just write it colorless and put the best people in it. That would be the dream. But if it is about a culture, then you have to be authentic to that culture. If you're going to tie in the Dia de los Muertos and have a tradition, then you need you need to to do it right. You need to do it justice. You know, with like Effie said. You know, if I loved your quote, you can say it again. Oh, you can't make something about us without us. Without us, there, there you go. go. Speaking to that as well, the the conversation of intersectionality, I want to get to that too. You know, there is a lot of conversation about, about gender equality, um, racial equality, but it seems almost counterintuitive to focus on any one element of that alone. So how can we work to make the industry more intersectional when we're addressing the topic and the topics of of discrimination and also inclusion, you know, confronting even issues of ableism. We don't, we don't, a lot of the time it feels like the discussion gets very narrowed. So what are, what are kind of the first steps towards people understanding uh, the, the complex layers of, of, you know, actually presenting a real fully formed um, story on screen, Renee, kind of just like you were discussing how you, y'all, work together to figure out the best story for this film. Um, so I guess I, I will ask, I'll send that one to you first. In terms of, well, I mean, I think it's, there's no one way, you know, to come up with a story. I think, you know, it depends on 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 what you're doing in and how you want to tell it. If it's, in, you know, for me, because when I'm watching, I go back to what I watch and what I'm interested in and, I love to watch women. My husband the other day put on a show and I said, I'm sorry, there's just no women on this. I'm just not interested in this experience as much as you are. And, and it's just, so I think of, okay, so I'm gonna be best at telling the stories that I'm interested in watching. I'm interested 
in diverse experiences in the world. I've traveled around mm -hmm. the world. This is who my friends are. And this is what I want to see. You know, I grew up not seeing myself on TV. I want to see that. I want my sons to see it. I want the next generation to see it. What I create is not just, you know, what, what the buyers want, but what the world needs. I say, you know, give them what they want, but slip in what they need. You know, we're working on something now that is, is, is for little boys and girls all, all around the world, but just to see the world differently, to expand their minds. I see how little boys have Dungeons and Dragons and, and Game of Thrones and all of these things that are typically masculine, but the little girls, when you go buy them a gift, for example, it's mm -hmm. and pony. So I want to change that sensibility, you know, just to, to shape the way we think. So I think it really is from the inception of your stories of what you pursue, what you put together, how you reinvent something, um, and just having that that peer view as, as you create. Um, River, to you, how can change in the industry be more intersectional? Uh, yeah, I wanted to touch on something that Renee and Delphine also talked about, just in terms of the label, lab, moving towards a world without labels. I think you know, that's definitely, if we're on one pendulum right now, which is like a world of like, you know, patriarchy, men are dominating, white people are dominating. And we want to get to this world where it's like egalitarian, where we're all seen and heard. In order to get to swing to that other side, we need the conscious and deliberate choices of the labels, of being proud of those labels, of of owning those labels, of the studios, agents, everyone on the business side to consciously be making those choices of we're going to this Latin A uh, director, we're going to this woman or this non-binary person. Um, even if it might seem a little bit mechanical at first, it's the only way for justice and reparations to be done after a film industry has been, you know, uh, the foundation of it has been a hundred years of just like white men dominating everything. So in order to move that this way, we need to consciously be making those choices for that one day, the idealized version of no labels to exist. So I just want to say that. Um, <laughs> just wanted to have that class. <laughs> so, but in terms of um, inclusive, I guess it's the same answer, really. It's about people taking the risk and also realizing that it's not a risk. Just like you said, Angelique, how you know Netflix and Amazon decided to make these specific black stories or these women narratives and then kind of the independent or international markets that kind of followed suit. I think people need to realize that those, those, and I get it, I know I'm a creative, so I'm like, just take the risk. But like, I know there's money and dollar spent involved. But like, I think people would be more pleasantly surprised to realize that like, I think it's, uh, I think people can understand non-binary people more than one person can, more than we think we can't perceive it. Um, I'll put it like that. Or, or, it, or it's going to take that one, like, you know, really good, enriching, like, story that, that it, frankly, just, like, good work speaks. Mm -hmm. and, and just taking the, the chance on, on artists that have a, a very specific voice, um, you know, specificity translates to universality, I believe. And and just, you know, really trusting that good work can can cross boundaries and, and cultures and and you know markets. I mean, again, this is me just saying <laughs> as a creator, you know, I, I think I think people on the business side, the studio side, need to just kind of like I don't, I don't know. I, I think about some of the movies that happen and I'm just like, really? That? <laughs> um, and it's just like, yeah. It, 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 and then sometimes they don't even make money. So it's just like, you know, I, I always think whenever a bad movie comes out, I'm like a collective group of people all thought that this bad idea was good. <laughs> and then it didn't even make money. So I'm just like, well, why not? Let's just take shots on good ideas. Um, period, and not think of like, you know, not be so caught up in this, you know, capitalistic game. Again, we need to make money, it's a business. But also I just think, you know, we, I think we need to take more risks 
um, in order to push culture forward and in order to push these conversations that, you know, activists are fighting for right now. And I think something that happened in the last two years is that, like, we're finally now really listening to activists, maybe because of social media and, and all this other, all these other tools. Um, but I think the the industry is fertile now for for these new conversations to be had. The point you made also is very important, though, there, too, that, you know, once you take that risk, a lot of times that risk being taken on a, a film about women or or people of color, it's like, okay, we did it one time, it didn't make any money, so we actually are, never have to make one again. And that's that's also not a, a realistic model of, of doing things. Has, has anyone witnessed kind of the industry becoming uh, less, or I guess, less risk averse when it comes to that? I know, can anybody speak to that part of things that, you know, are we seeing the risk be taken more often? Is that actually, a, is that really happening or is it only happening every once in a while? Well, Tuna, do you want to talk about Netflix? Like what, how you felt there in terms of risk or? Yeah, I mean, I think with, I think with, with, with Netflix, I, I don't know that we ever even categorized it as a risk. <laughs> um, I think we, we always saw it as, um, as an opportunity um, because obviously, and even just, you know, just as a pure business play, because those were the stories that were not being financed. Those were the audiences that were not being served. Um, and so it was just this kind of constant um, building out of, you um, of, uh, of, of going into different narratives to sort of, to kind of find the new stories. Um, I, I did want to go back to the, the label question because um, I completely agree that like, we do still need some sort of like, it's like at the studio side um, and what, the financing side, some sort of labeling to make sure it's deliberate and that we're making sure that eventually we can get back, to, get to this egalitarian utopia. The one place though that I, I, I do, um, it shapes me quite a bit when I do see labels is in the media um, because until um, uh, I start seeing white male filmmaker makes certain something or white male filmmaker debuts, I don't want to see black female filmmaker because there is like, I, I, I hope that point comes across because to me, I, I when I would speak with like black women filmmakers who, um, or any, any type of labeling, um, there, there often is this kind of um, uh, frustration that, you know, when they come to interviews, when they come to talk about their art, that they, by that labeling, they only become that thing. Whereas white male filmmakers are always presented as filmmaker, full stop, no moniker, and are able to talk about the range of their art, their technique, their influence, and so on and so forth. And um, and I think that there there, I would love to see some sort of egalitarian. You know, if, if we're going to label everyone, let's label everybody. But, yeah. but let's make sure that um, because I think it also touches on the intersectionality piece, right? Um, because actually, where you see a lot of intersectionality are from trans non-binary filmmakers, are from Black women filmmakers. You see a lot of intersectionality in those works. Um, and so oftentimes when we reduce it to whatever the label du jour is of that, of that moment, um, you lose a lot of that, that piece. And also more often, and then I know this is something that in my industry happens a lot, a lot of what we're celebrating is not often great. Like the general idea that, for example, Nia DaCosta is the first black woman to have a film open at number one is incredible for Nia DaCosta, but also should be, you know, very frustrating and humiliating for the film industry at large that it's Absolutely. 2021 and that's just Absolutely. Not happening. Absolutely. Um, but Effie, I'm sorry, you you were going to say something before I went on my rant. No, no, no. Actually, no, no, no. high five all of these conversations, like high five, high five. My, um, <laughs> my um, what I wanted to, I think I don't want to miss an opportunity to talk about money because this is a business again and i think when they're talking about inclusivity and equity right you know what i mean i'm like fine with equality i want equity you know what i mean um it's that we until we start talking about and i mean this exactly how much we make what our deals were um we will never we will never be able to have that sort of parity 
you know, I am the lady of a certain age, going to be 50 in November. What? I know. What? 50 and <laughs> leaving? I know. Um, no, but I've been around. I say that because I've been around a long time. And mm -hmm. it's become, and I have to tell you, it was, I'm grateful that I'm a um, CEO and I'm owner, a majority owner of Game Changer. But it was at this sort of finally having been at the seat at the table and then asking people, well, how much did you make mm -hmm. to produce yeah. that movie? And then to who have less credits than me, less juge than me, and to be like, you were making five hundred to seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars for the same damn job that I'm doing for like one seventh of that, and being happy because I'm like, woo, you know, that sort of thing. Like finding out that information is it's deep, and you realize when people are being like, oh my god, and gratefully we're having these conversations where I was like, I'll be vulnerable. I'm like, I have a brand of being brash. I'll say how much I'm making. And then having that conversation come back to me with my, with white male counterparts where they were like, oh my God, how much are you making? What are you paying? Oh no. And then literally getting kissed into deals, right? That they were like, let's get your quote up. That is deep after doing 20 movies, one in the national registry. Do you know what I mean? Like that is deep. And until you're able, and I'm grateful that I have other friends now i just talked to another friend who's running a company as well and i'm like how much do you pay yourself mm -hmm. these things are really important because until we level up that way that you know mm -hmm. i don't think there's a way for it right i mean renee what do you guys think i mean that's oh, yeah i mean i've been mm -hmm. so many movies to producers to partner on i had one white male producer offer 10 percent of his deal with no back end whereas mary parrot when i would take her a movie it was such a different you know, for proposition, and there have been men that have been unbelievably generous, but you have to really fight for yourself. You have to be really, really clear. You want a percentage of the gross because there's one pot for the producers. And, exactly. and also dealing with the studios. I'm talking about getting the deal from the studio because that's another, and also, and I'm going to kick, sorry, I'm not I'm going to take over Angelique, but I'm like, dying to hear from Helene, you know, from Delphine, because she's on both sides. She does the sales and financing. I mean, I'm, I'm, and I know you already, you pay like your female producers and projects the same as the men, right? Oh yeah, we fight. We fight with that. No, we do because like, yeah, you know, yeah. first of all, we are a female company and it's very funny because at some point we were like, with my partner, Ariane, we were like, should we stop hiring female? Mm -hmm. Is it like, you know, are we like not very equal to everybody? And we're like, nah, you know, we need to support the moms. We need to support the, the, the women, you know. And also what I found to go back to the money and how much we're making, I think the big change is, has to come from us. We have mm -hmm. been told, us women and diversity and all kind of like minority, we have been told that we should not make as much money. And yeah. we should feel bad if we do make a lot of money. But a lot of people take a lot of money for themselves and they don't care about you. So I think it should come from us. And we should be, no, I'm worth it. I am worth as much as that person, even more, because I know how to do that job. And I don't sleep and eat and do anything. But that person doesn't do shit, but makes more than me. Right on. So it's, and it's still, you know, we have been in that industry for a long time in our company, 10 years. And we're still the one being pushed. The girls are always pushed. When somebody has to cut their feet to make that movie happen, guess what? The first one they ask, us. Yeah. And we're like, why? I don't get it. So we have to be like, no, we're not going to cut our feet. Sorry, we do the job like everybody else. So we have to be like entitled. Just be entitled. I know. Just be entitled. Totally. That's it. <laughs> Well, Delphine, actually, I'm going to make you keep going because our first question uh, from the audience, from Kathleen from Toronto, um, is to you, you know, speaking to what you touched on earlier with agreement terms, um, Kathleen says, I find navigating some of the legalities of the film industry, especially relating to finance, can be intimidating sometimes. Do you have any advice for how to do that well? Um, Delphine, I'll start with you and then uh, pass that question uh, potentially around to a few others as well. Yeah, 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 sure. So I think that, you know, what's important in making a film is the team. And the team is not just the team on set. It's the entire team. So um, we recommend, we're a sound agent, of course, but we, we do much more than just being a sound agent. But, and maybe because we're women, we are dedicated to the people we partner with. We support our producers since the beginning. We want them to get their return. 
that it could be 5, 10, 1%, 15%, 20%. We're there for that because we want a long business um, to go on with those people. So pick a sell agent or a financial partner that you trust, that you really feel that you can do business with. And then some people bring experience and knowledge that you don't, and you have to trust those people. So, you know, we are we created our um, model and our reputation on the fact that we are straightforward. So we're like, this is your movie. This is how much it's going to make. And people are like, no, 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 but I want to make it for 20. I'm like, well, it's not happening. So what do you want to do? You want to go see the neighbor? Because the neighbor is going to tell you you can make it, but it's never going to happen. So what do you want to do? So we can help you to make it for that price. And you have your movie out and you have your idea everywhere in the world and everybody's going to watch. And then we go and we do the next one. And then people are like, no, 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 no. We're going to go there. And then they come back. They say, okay, you were right. And we're like, okay. So trust the people that know what they are doing. And if you have a good feeling, it's instinct too, you know. Don't listen to people who bullshit you and makes you hear whatever you want to hear because that never works. And then, then yeah, trust your team. And that helps. Because if you don't know the legal terms, if you don't know the finance term, then partner with somebody who does. And then that works. Renee, I would love to hear your take on this question as well. Well, I would just, as Delphine said, you know, the team is so important. If there is something you don't know, you know, seek counsel. You know, I mean, uh, my partner, who is my husband, used to run a film finance company and was, you know, it navigates those waters so well. And I've learned so much. And, you know, I come from representation, but it's the partnership that really works because it's the yin and yang and we, we complement each other. So it's absolutely, you know, don't, don't go out there on your own and put everything on your shoulders. And what I'm so impressed with Highland, I just want to say, because Delphine and the, the girls are changing the game of distribution because okay. typically, it, it, no, they are, it is backwards. It's always been about well, that big male actor and they are changing the combination so they get stronger supporting actors so they can break you know, different people. You're trying, but you know, trying is, is, is change, you know? Exactly. Every step. Step. Every step towards progress is getting us closer. So thank you. Yes. Yeah. Would anyone else like to? Yeah, please. Oh, yeah, just wanted to jump. I while I do believe in the team, um, it is I I as when I was a Netflix exec, I was so impressed by the filmmakers who came in and knew something. Yeah. Um, because I because it, it it doesn't if you spent so much time putting writing your film or directing your film, putting it together take just a sliver of that to understand the other films that are like your films, like the comps, where did they go? If they went to a streamer, if they went to the box office, and then if you can somehow through. Oh no. We are so close. Oh, Luna, you were killing it. it. The, the best <laughs> and most important. Um, and they were like, what? No. No, she's about to drop a bomb too. I know, she's like, eh. Well, we're not leaving just yet, but until we get Funa back, um, Effie or River, would one of y'all like to answer this question real quick? Uh, the, uh, the, sorry, the question was, the I mean, for me, I mean, I'm just about financing. My yeah, thing is like, what, about what's just, a practical tip? Go ahead. Yeah, a practical tip about financing and kind of navigating we'll talk, those legalities really. of the film industry. I'll bullet point it. A lawyer, it's worth their weight in gold a good lawyer and also engaging in your community. I recently was involved in a deal that didn't sound right. Yay, food is back. But I don't know what happened. <laughs> I know. And you were so excited. No, wait, finish your point, Funa, and then I'll go to mine. Keep going. Yeah, uh, just very, very quick. I don't even remember where I ended, but basically- I don't know if it was good, girl. We were rating. Was what other other filmmakers are doing. Yes, reach out to other filmmakers. So if there's one who's made it, reach out to filmmakers. As Effie said, have the conversation. Everybody loves to talk. Um, and yeah, and then come into those rooms prepared because even then, like even with your team, you may have a sales rep, you want to be armed in those conversations with some sort of idea of, um, of where you want your film to land. I, I, I can't tell you, um, I, I think, well, I could say I count fully on one hand the amount of times, um, you know, I'd bump into a filmmaker at a film festival and they'd be like, oh, I like my film, it didn't end up on Netflix. And I was like, but, I was like, what? But your your agent passed on the offer we gave. And they're like, well, what was the offer? And I was like, what? Well, this is the offer. And they'd be like, what? And I'd be like, 
okay. <laughs> like, you know, it's like, and so it would just be like, it would be like things like that that would happen. And and so make sure you guys are you're aligned on goals. Make sure you understand how the process works. Don't walk in. This is not this is not the time to walk in there. The kind of oh, I'm the artist. Uh, know something. The you know, so know the business. You need to know the business just a little bit. <laughs> Our <lot. laughs> As much as you can. I mean, this that is really what this conversation is about is, you know, how knowledge is power. And it is, we, it is so appreciated to from all of you giving uh, the audience some of that knowledge. Effie River, before we go, want to let you guys get in one last thought. Uh, River, you go. I've been talking a lot. Go ahead. I mean, what Funa said, I was like, I mean, I've been taking notes. Uh, but yeah, I guess I would just say, yeah, I mean, what Effie was started to say about a lawyer, you know, having a good team, knowing when to trust your team and knowing when to take their advice, but also feeling instinctually or intuitively when to not trust their advice and when to be like, you know what, I am actually going to have this conversation with this person that you told me not to have. And then something magical can happen out of it because you just trusted yourself. Um, so it's a tricky line of like listening to the people in your tribe and then also just having that impulse to be like, actually, I have to do this for myself. And then sometimes there's the biggest gifts that happen from those conversations. Right on. Uh, really quickly then, I'm just going to yes. say two little nuggets. All money is not good money. <laughs> Beware of where you get it, where get your financing from. All money is not good money. And I really would love for uh, the creatives and also the producers. Um, it's important that you're a visionary and that you know exactly where you want to go. It's very, very important, but almost as important uh, to be coachable. That's it. So be a visionary, but still be coachable. That's all I got. You guys are awesome. I'm so glad to be here with you guys. <laughs> we're so glad to have you all. I mean, like you were saying, uh, River, like I'm just taking notes. There's an, an encyclopedia of knowledge here. So thank you so much for sharing all of your wisdom. Um, and thank you so much to the audience for all of our questions and for turning in and for tuning in to this panel. Um, thank you so much, everyone. And thanks also to the TIFF team for hosting us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us.